Hi, thank you all for coming. I'm Tara Donahue Willerup, and I am um, a trustee of the Sims Reef Free Library. And we are glad to have you here in our series of Sims Reef Free Library on Simsbury. Today's subject is Highline Tower, and Jay Willerup will be presenting. He is a co president of the Friends of Highline Tower. And um, he is very excited and loves the building and has done a lot of restoration work, and he'll be able to tell you all about it. Um, the library, just for you, just so that you know, on the second Tuesdays of the month, we have book club. I see a couple of my book club members here. And on the fourth Tuesday, we do a um, movie day. We do it at one o'clock in the afternoon, and uh, we do documentary films. And they're, you know, you can't always see them everywhere else. Please check our website, simsreefreelibrary.org, on the internet and see what else we have. We have Connecticut uh, Women in History uh, presentation will be here in March. We're doing a uh, field trip to the Chick Austin House on Scarborough Street in April. And so we have a bunch of different things that are going on. So please keep checking. That would be very helpful. <laughs> Judy? Tara, what about the, um, the movie at 11.15? We're going to do a movie at 11.15 um, on the Thursday, the fourth Thursday. We're going to do a movie at 11 on the fourth Thursday. The same movie we'll do on Tuesday on the first. The next movie is Exit Through the Gift Shop. And it's a renowned documentary, so it should be great. Um, Jay Willer. Thank you. Um, thanks to the Simsbury Free Library for letting me come here and uh, tell you all about the um, about the High Blind Tower. Its history is pretty fascinating. Uh, I have found over the last week or two that I've been working on putting this presentation together. Um, I thought I knew a fair amount, but oh my God, I got into the archives and I know like this much. But I'm going to try to give you as much as I can. Um, as you know, it's, it's such a landmark up there. Uh, for those of you people who grew up in the valley, um, we see it every day, all day. And whether you, if you fly in from on, being on vacations or traveling on business, you always know your home when you see the High Blind Tower. Um, we found that uh, it's such a landmark, and, and I'm going to throw this out to you. Uh, how many people have not been there? One, two, not bad. And that's an issue. We want you to get there. Um, it's, we have an issue with, uh, uh, it's not an issue, it's just, it's just life. It's uh, a restriction on the deed. There is a road coming from the south off of Route 44, Montevideo, it goes over private land. The private landowner has requested that it's only uh, emergency access vehicles, volunteers, state workers, and things like that. So, and special permission. We do once in a while get special permission to have events up there. Otherwise, it's one of the only state parks that's a hike-only uh, state park, which is fun. I mean, uh, if you go up there uh, really any time of the year, and I've been up there New Year's, uh, there's, there's people walking around. Uh, it's, it draws quite a few people. Actually, annually, it draws 100,000 people, roughly. That is um, more than Mark Twain, and it is less than uh, Gillette's Castle. So it, it ranks, ranks right up there. We get uh, people from this past year, we tallied it up. Um, of the people that signed in, we got 42 different countries, or excuse me, 42, 42 states, 48 countries from around the world. Um, so it's, it's, it's a draw. Uh, you know, we, we kind of take it for granted uh, that it's in our own backyard. But there's some wonderful history up there, and I'll, and I'll start in. Um, these are some of the topics I'd like to, t uh, to touch base. Uh, Friends of the High Blind Tower, that's who we are. We'll touch uh, a little bit on the family, um, the company. This is what made, made them so prominent um, and ended up getting, uh, getting the tower up there. Uh, there were previous towers uh, prior to what we know as the High Blind Tower. Talk about the High Blind Tower. It then uh, changed names and became the Harper Times Tower. Uh, then went into private ownership, became a state park. And we'll talk about what's next. And uh, then I'll have some questions, uh, answer questions, and uh, I got a little surprise for you. So, friends of High Blind Tower, who are we? What do we do? Um, this is our, some of our motley group. We had a little fundraiser up here um, to raise awareness of, uh, of the tower and, and, and raise funds for restoration. Uh, when, you know, it's, it's 100 years old next year, uh, and being on that prominent point, it takes a beating. Uh, it is also seen uh, in the 60s, saw heavy vandalism. So when the state purchased it, um, there, there was no furniture. Uh, there were a lot of broken windows and um, it, it, it was a mess. So our mission as a friends group 
uh, is to get it back into the 1914 era. Uh, actually, there have been additions in 1921, 1928, so it's, we're really trying to get back to 28, in essence. Um, th these two people I want to point out, these are two of our board members. Uh, Rick Willard's been on the board since 1985, which was our inception. And the woman to the right, Louise Jakes, is the granddaughter of the caretaker that lived up there. We don't have any high blinds on the board. Uh, it's funny, they, they actually show no interest in, in the tower at all. It's, it's kind of like, you know, when you sold your first car and you don't care where it is, it's like, you know, for them it, it doesn't mean anything to them anymore. Uh, but Louise, uh, her, her grandparents were the caretakers. They lived up there um, from when the tower was built in the 14s up until uh, almost all the way through to the end of the Harper Times era. And I'll talk to them, I'll talk to them about, uh, about that a little bit. One, you know, we're, we're very much a hands-on group. Here's one of our guys washing windows, Kent Robbins. Uh, some of the things we do, we do fundraisers. We need the money in order to buy materials, have people come up and do the restoration. This is from the Tower Tooth this past year. We'll get anywhere from three to 4,000 people up there a day. Uh, and it's, it's fun, you walk across the, uh, um, the lawn and if you're, if you're slow, you'll pick up dialects from all over the world. I mean, you, 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 and, it's, and it's here in our little Simsbury. And it is Simsbury, it's not Avon. Even though I grew up in Avon, we like to take claim to it, but it's, um, it's really in Simsbury. We uh, flip burgers, sell bratwurst, have a grand time. We have uh, these guys, these two guys German, uh, that play German music, uh, and people just come up just for that. I mean, they'll brave foul weather just to come up for, uh, uh, for the fun. We, uh, we take it on the road. This is from, from uh, Avon Days. Again, trying to build awareness, take donations, tell people what we do, try to get people up there. Some of the projects, and I'll try to go through these quickly, this, uh, we were missing some lights. And uh, I had heard about it and saw pictures and, and uh, we ended up getting a couple guys to start donating materials and fabrication time. These are, these are canopies. Uh, we couldn't find anybody to do them. Myself and two other board members um, said, well, let's give it a try. So we ended up building them, copper capped, had the holes drilled, and there they are done. We've got four of them up there. So I mean, these, this is kind of, I mean, it's, it takes away from family time, it takes away from business, but, uh, but we all have a passion and we, and we all laugh up there because we all, um, we just want to retire there. Um, the, the gentleman who was washing the windows, Kent Robbins, uh, owns Robbins Hardwood Flooring and, and I broached him one day and we were gonna take on this, this flooring uh, project up in the observation level. And I said, we understand it was Oak Parquet. Can you come and help us out? We're gonna buy the wood. We're gonna work a deal with the state. The state owns the building. They're gonna remove the vinyl asbestos floor. Can you kind of help us lay it out? And we were kind of hoping that he would give us a couple hours. Well, he said, yeah, when do you want me to start? And I said, well, let me, you know, get my forces together. Well, he ended up donating the floor, a tremendous donation. They ended up I mean, the state ended up picking up the vinyl asbestos floor and the underlayment, and we were actually able, able to see the nailing pattern because we didn't have pictures of the floor. It was all up by hearsay. Uh, so that new floor is an exact recreation, an exact location of, of the original. That's the kind of fun stuff we have. The, um, and, and you'll see it in some of the pictures that will come up. Um, all the wood paneling is, is original in a Hartford Times era was painted. It just happens. That's what people did in that area. Era. So we ended up having that stripped and um, uh, restored as well. We've come across 60 some odd drawings of the two editions, 1921, 1928 edition. What had happened with the tower is uh, they ended up building the tower in 1914 and they kept using it more and more and more. You know, they loved it up there. High blinds were from Hartford so they would, they would come up for the summer um, and they, they, in 1921 they put an addition on uh, which included uh, Gilbert's bedroom, a sun porch on the upper floor, which is up, up here, uh, a dining room, kitchen, maids quarters, three, three maids bedrooms, uh, mechanical space, and, and a couple other things. Uh, so they started using it and using it as entertaining, uh, as an entertainment venue. Um, some of the other things we have, this is actually in Louise's bedroom, uh, Mrs. Highline's bedroom. 
uh, we've acquired not only things related to the tower, but things related to the company. These were the uh, uh, front doors from the, I think it was their last, not last location, fourth location on Broad Street, if, I, if memory serves me correct. Um, and you can see uh, one of the other questions I have for you is, uh, is it high blind, hue blind, or hoi blind? You're all right. <laughs> because it, it's, it's, it's high blind is the family. And when they started the business, they wanted to a little differentiate, so they called themselves Hue Blind. So if you're, if you're talking about the company, it's Hue Blind. Talking about the family, it's High Blind. Actually, the, the correct pronunciation is Hoi Blind. Uh, but one of the things that they were doing when in, uh, in the business is they used this little marketing tool here. You, you may not be able to see it, but these are two, two people, two uh, servers. Uh, and their names are Hugh and Blind. <laughs> so that's, that's how you can differentiate it. Um, this is, uh, again, you go up into, into the building. Uh, we would like to restore this back to Louise's bedroom, but these just how some of the uh, uh, corporate artifacts, um, I don't know if you can see, A1 steak sauce. That got them through some tough times with prohibition. It, it was able to keep things going. Um, well, Smirnoff, I don't need to say anything about that. Moscow mules, those are kind of fun. Those were uh, developed in the 30s. Uh, uh, John G. Martin, who was Gilbert's grandson, um, was sitting at a bar and they were trying to figure out what to do with a couple different ingredients and they came up with these the cocktails and became pretty famous for them. And they were always served in copper mugs. We also have a gift store. Uh, these are some of the things that we sell. Again, try to raise money. Christmas ornaments. A little bit about the family. Uh, and let's see if this works. Where's my mouse? No, it's not going to. Nope. No big deal. Um, <laughs> It starts with Andrew Highbline. Gilbert's, now Gil, let me explain who Gilbert is. Gilbert owned Highbline Tower. It was his dad, Andrew, who really started in the business in New Haven. He started a restaurant and a hotel. Uh, very successful, very well renowned in the business. He brought it to Hartford, introduced his sons to it. Um, and he had, a, he had a couple other children as well. This is his wife. This is Lewis, one of the sons, and part of Gilbert. <laughs> Originally, he was a full picture, but in the transfer, uh, kind of lost him. Uh, so this was his house, and, and uh, he originally lived in Hartford, and that was his, his year-round home, and uh, would come to the tower as, uh, as a summer resident. And um, he ended up, oh, when he was just young and, and married, brought his wife up there, and uh, said to her, he says, you know, someday I'm going to build you a castle here. And uh, he was 60, in his 60s when, when, he, when he built the tower. His wife, Louise, and our board member, Louise Jakes, is named after her, as are a few other people. And then I'll, I'll skip a generation, because the, the generation after Gilbert um, really didn't play much of a role in the tower and of the company. This gentleman, John G. Martin, really took Highline and, and took it to a huge level. Um, they happened to uh, actually back in back a little bit um, back in the late 1800s. The uh, the hotel was um, was hosting the governor's foot guard or horse guard. I think it might have been horse guard. Um, and uh, the event had to be canceled due to weather, just like last weekend. And um, so they, they had all these drinks ready to go, and they were kind of the, the organization, the service organization, that was just top notch. So that when you walked in the door, there was a cocktail waiting for you. If you wanted a martini or you wanted a, a this or that, it was there. You didn't have to ask for it, you just went and grabbed it. So they had all these pre made cocktails. Well, I just let it out. All of a sudden, there's no party. What are you going to do with all these drinks? They put them in the, uh, the high line, said, Phew throw them out, That's, we just lost our profit. 
One of the guys said, no, I'm just going to, they're, they're fine, put them in the refrigerator. They ended up putting them in the refrigerator, served it the next week or whenever the party was. That was the introduction of pre-made cocktails, which were very popular. John G. Martin uh, stepped back up to the grandson in the 30s, ended up um, meeting with a gentleman from uh, Waterbury, uh, Schmirnoff with, uh, it was either a single F or a V, there's a little controversy on that, um, who had come here and started producing vodka, didn't have any of the makings to get it out and distributed and, and uh, uh, you know, publicity, uh, you know, hit, hit it on the market. He ended up buying, buying it, everybody thought he was crazy. Um, Shmirnoff is huge, just absolutely huge. Uh, he hit it right and hit it strong. He had the marketing capabilities. Uh, he had the distribution. He had the manufacturing. That's really what took High Blind and really took them up a, a huge step. Uh, this is where they are now. Uh, this is actually in Cedar, Cedar Hill Cemetery South. Uh, uh, the whole High Blind family uh, has this huge plot there. Uh, this is Gilbert's house uh, on Prospect. Um, it was really pretty funny. Um, <laughs> We, my co-president and I were, were invited to, uh, to have cocktails there one evening uh, with the new, fairly new owners. They'd been, been there about two, three years. And uh, we were chatting and um, they had asked us to come by and, and share anything about the house and about the family that they could or that we could. So I was sitting across from Bob, the homeowner, and, and I, I asked him, I said, where'd you come from? And he, or where would you move from? And he said, oh, up in Burlington. And I said, whereabouts? And he said, up near Johnny Cake Mountain. And um, I said, oh, very interesting. And uh, he said, yeah, I said, I, he's, he goes, he said, I, I wish I was there 40 years ago. And I said, oh, why is that? He said, well, there's this guy across the street that, that threw these legendary parties. And he said he had, he had cattle, he had movie stars, he had everybody. He said the food, the, the wine, the spirits, he said it was, it was just legendary. This is Gilbert's house. So this gentleman, Bob Aria, built or uh, bought Gilbert's house. His, Gilbert's grandson was the gentleman who lived across the street, John G. Martin. So I said to Bob, I said, so the guy you're thinking about out in Burlington is Gilbert's grandson. He didn't know that. He was like, wow. You know, all of a sudden it kind of comes full circle. Small world. So they've done a great job restoring it. Highline the company, as I said, uh, it, it started in New Haven, came to Hartford. Uh, great restaurant and hotel. There's an entry. Pretty classy in his day. Had a Raskeller, really big in, in uh, it had a big draw, uh, German draw. Um, got to be pretty well known. They called it the Opera House. High Blind Brothers, because it was actually um, Gilbert and his brother who uh, were taking it over at, the, at that time. Interesting that they had Anheuser-Busch Budweiser on draft. Then he got into, uh, uh, as I started to say, you know, got into the production of uh, premixed cocktails. So this was their first headquarters. And, th and this took it from just the hotel restaurant and just really got it into an offshoot. I was just wondering, Dave, what time period is, is, is this photograph right here? Stuff we're talking about? Uh, turn of the century. Okay. So a lot of this, uh, th they were in the hotel business from 1860s, 70s up until just past the turn of the century. And then, and then it really just moved into the spirits, spirits business. So this is downtown Hartford right around that time? Yeah. Uh, there's their building. That's the first location. Second was on Trumbull. This is into the 30s and 40s. I can tell by the architecture as you can too, Rick. Uh, inside, uh, you know, great spaces. You know, very uncluttered spaces. There's some of the uh, the uh, the bottling area. And from from what people say, if you worked at Highline. Very well. You were very real, well respected. You were very well treated. They really cared about their product, their quality, treating their employees well, and bottling. 
when I was putting this together, I was trying to read what these tanks were. Now I can, but you know, it was, it was, it was some of these photographs I've seen for the first time, and it was just just fascinating going through them. Uh, there's there's no label as to whether it's. I'm sure it's vodka. Must be vodka. I mean, you, you know, look at look at the shipping. Uh, you know, spotless, nice and clean. And then they ended up here in, in uh, into uh, Farmington. That was their headquarters in Farmington, which which you, uh, um, I'm sure you recognize on the Farmington exit. Um, this was this was built in 1973. Um, Highline ended up selling to R. J. Reynolds in uh, 1984. Um, anybody guess as to how much that sale might have been? Throw out some numbers to me. How much? Oh, you're saying in the 70s? Yeah. Uh, $1.4 billion. That's how successful they were. And it was privately owned up until then. Privately owned up until then, yeah. So that's that's the company, and, and uh, now we're going to talk a little bit about what the what happened on the ridge. Um, there were a series of towers there. This is the first one. We really don't have any documentation on this. Uh, this is to familiarize yourself. Uh, the Highline Tower would be somewhere along here. This is what is known as Ho Pond, which is between Highline Tower and the Science Center. Um, and this is roughly where Conover's house is. This is, uh, um, that building is no longer there. It was uh, the Woodsworth, or excuse me, Wadsworth Estate, as in Wadsworth Athenaeum. This is the house kind of from the pond. Um, interesting, you know, again, looking at some of these photographs, large scale, it's great. Uh, looks like there was some kind of a tower here, some kind of an observation tower, but that we really don't call it a tower per se, is, Comparison to what uh, what was on the ridge. This is the other side. Pond would be to your right, and uh, the cliff to the left. Interesting, you know. Again, when you you blow these shots up, you're like, okay, what's this gable end and a spire here? It's kind of a little archaeology. Um, for those of you who have been up Montevideo towards the end, before you make the turn towards. Uh, uh, towards the east and up towards the Science Center, uh, you'll probably recognize this is one of the barns, and this is what they call the parsonage. It's, it was never a parsonage, per se. It was probably some twenty-some-odd-year-olds putting, you know, stealing a sign and putting it on there. Uh, this building is no longer there, but this is all part of, part of the uh, Wadsworth Estate. Um, this was one of the. the uh, this was actually the second tower. Um, that was was up there. They, uh, the first three either burned or or uh, or blew down. Uh, you know, there you can see that there's some guy wires to in an attempt to try to keep it stable. Ha! Huh. Another shot of it. Would Actually, they, go ahead. Um, I don't know about a fire tower. Good point. Um, it was, uh, these were private and then they got into public. This one was private, uh, this was the second tower, and then this tower, which was the third, uh, ended up getting into, um, um, let's see, it went Wadsworth, Collins, as in Collins Company bought the Wadsworth estate up there, and then got into Bartlett, and Kellogg, and it was it was in that transition that it became um, public. Um, you know, they were running a little, in essence, a little business up there. Um, you could go up there, um, you know, 1874, and uh, this sounds really really appetizing. A, a meal with cold meat, 75 cents. Um, yeah, yeah, that was that was his as well. Um, you get your horses fed, four quarts, oats under the shed for 35 cents. And it was, and it was this tower that Mark Twain and Sam Twitch, or, um, uh, Jonathan Twitchell, uh, who was the pastor at uh, Salem Hill Congregational Church, they would leave their houses on a Sunday morning and walk up here. 
You could actually get a, uh, get a trolley, a horse-drawn trolley from Hartford, uh, and they would get you up here as well. So in essence, he was almost running a little, I don't want to say an amusement park, but, a, but you could dance up there, you could look you know, out at the vistas. Um, so there was, there was some public, public access up there. This is all before High Vine. There's a little dance floor. Uh, it's pretty much all that, that's left. Uh, there is a bolt up there just south of the eating, you know, for those of you who have been up there, south of the eating pavilion uh, near the water tank. There's some remnants of, of it. And then this is, uh, we kind of include this because it's, it's really kind of on the same bridge. This is also the Bartlett Tower. This was the one that was in Terrafil, which was very public. So we get into the High Blind Tower. Uh, you can see its roots in Bavaria where, where the High Blind family was from. And this is it under construction. It was designed to withstand 100 mile an hour winds. I can attest to at least half that. Um, it was you know, iron riveted, uh, drilled into the bedrock. And it's pretty solid. And one of the things you'll, you'll have to see is uh, it's this floor is where the observation level, and, and look at, well, you can see it here. And here's the base floor. Here's the observation level. And this is where the public can go. But yet you can get another almost three stories up. And I've been up there, and it's, it's fun. It's really commanding view. Here it is under construction. And again, this is just the tower. The, the tower was, you know, you don't see anything off to the, to the east side. So it was just, just the tower um, and, and the base. Right, Gilbert and Louise. And when did they buy the land? Bought the land uh, around 1910, 1911. They acquired a, a bunch of land there. Here's an aerial shot from the south. You know, Simsbury is to the left. Here's the tower. This is at least 1921 because the first edition is on uh, we can start to date it. Uh, it was really, really somewhat of a working estate. Uh, don't forget the Sartorias, which were the uh, caretakers. They lived up there. Uh, they lived in a in a nine room uh, apartment over the garage. Uh, they had outbuildings for tractors. Uh, they had sheep, goats, um, uh, vegetables, and the like. Uh, and that was all over in this area. There's a water tower. Uh, the tank is no longer there, but this structure is there. Uh, they would take water from Ho Pond, pump it, um, and then subsequently there was a, a building built here that had a 40,000 gallon cistern, get it into, uh, uh, into the tower itself. And then they had these fun little, they called them summer homes. Uh, they had two of them. One is uh, at, at this area, which is what they call the Royal View. Here's the croquet court, and it's kind of off onto the rocks there. This is looking from the tower, kind of back, Again, here's the three-car three garage, the caretaker's room on top of it. This is 19, late 20s, 30s. There's the garage. Uh, as you see it now, uh, just this is intact, just the first floor. The, when the state took over in the, in the, in the 60s, um, everybody was in a different mindset. Uh, you, you know, one of these... Um, well, this one. This building here, um, state deemed that they didn't need it. Uh, this one here, state deemed they didn't need that. So they called the Avon Fire Department and said, you need to practice. So there it went. And, uh, and, and this building was taken, the whole roof was taken off, the whole floor was taken off and the roof line lowered just so it's a single story. Uh, but it's fun, you go up into the attic and you see the, the finished floor and you see where it stops for like this much and you know where, that's where the wall is. You can tell where doors are. So we kind of have this little imprint that if we ever wanted to recreate it, we could. This side of it. It's, it's interesting, you know, you look at the tower, it's very, very Bavarian uh, but a lot of these outbuildings are very much Adirondack style, you know, very kind of New England woods, uh, very rough and rustic. 
These are the caretakers, the Sartoris. Again, they lived there uh, well in, into the 1940s. This is their daughter, Tosca. Towers in the background. The um, um, croquet court, they would flood once in a while and use a little skating pond. Again, these are some of the buildings that are no longer there. Uh, this, uh, um, this was one of the ones that was burnt, uh, but the foundation, uh, the, all the stonework is still there. And that's actually on our, on our uh, master plan wish list that we could recreate it, use the uh, first floor as a, as a work area, second floor as a, as a meeting space. This is the uh, summer, what they call a summer home, which is out on the Royal View, kind of south of the tower. These great little gazebos. Here's the tower in, in full ivy, you know, full bloom of ivy, you know, very different than it is today. And here are the original lights, which we've created. Is that the front door? That's the front door. This is the, uh, the west side, yeah. Uh, one of the other shots that I had said that there was the water tower. The actual water tower is right here. This was an eating pavilion that they built in 28. And underneath it is this huge cistern to hold, that holds 40,000 gallons of water. The average 20 by 40 pool is about 20,000 gallons. There's about 40,000 gallons, so it's a lot of water. Yes? Two quick ones. The cistern is the one that sits underneath there. And the other question was um, two pictures back, the one that burned down. Is that. Yeah, that one. Is that the one that we still see with the three walls? Yeah. Yep. Okay, so it's right down from the garage? Yep. Um, you, you see the three walls. This front portion has been knocked down. Yeah, okay. We know that. Sure yeah. Yep. And it's interesting. You see, you know, I didn't even know that there was that one off in the, into the left, which is yeah. somewhere in the woods there. Or, well, it's not there, but remnants of it. And, and you, can see the, um, you can see the tower uh, and, and the window configurations. When the state took it over, uh, that changed a little bit. Which, which I'll show you. At the, at the um, bottom of these stairs, this is, this is the west entrance facing Avon. You would come out, walk down these stairs, um, and you'd end up in this little picnic area, again, with another little summer house uh, for entertaining. Here we are, the, everything's done. Building's all done. The 1914 building, uh, building 21 edition and the 28 edition is done. Uh, you walk in, this was, when you walk into the front entry, um, it's very different than it is today in that uh, when the state took it over and be it became a, a public facility, you had to have fire stairs. You might get away with that today, with, without putting them in today, um, but they had to really rip the whole back side of the tower uh, and, and put those stairs in. And in doing so, uh, there was a fireplace in every room on the uh, south side. So this fireplace went, uh, a little storage room. This was an Otis elevator that went all the way up to the floor below the main flo uh, the observation floor. One of the first residential elevators that Otis ever made. Uh, and, and when the state purchased it, uh, it, it, it wasn't necessarily like this, but uh, the Otis elevator was still there. And um, someone had gone up there and cut the cables and it went down into the basement and just shattered. Yeah. Yes, Jason? Do you know how many square feet we lost by having the, the deck through the staircase going up? Um, yeah, because actually on, on the opposite side, yeah, this window is in the stairwell. So you, you've lost about three or four feet. Uh, the good thing is, there's good in everything. Uh, they saved all the paneling, and they saved all this uh, detail up there. So, uh, and, and it's upstairs in the garage. So at some point, you know, we have this, this huge master plan of, and wish list. We can't return it to its original state, but we can still put the paneling back and at least get most of it, uh, most of it done. So this is the foyer. Actually, they called it, the, it was really a living, it was one of the living rooms. 
Um, kind of a fun story in that uh, the piano in the corner, uh, rumor has it we know where it is. I don't know where it is. One of our board members might. Um, as I said, I grew up in Avon, and my dad was a businessman at, at uh, Connecticut General, and, and one of the fun things he used to like to do was he was a, a very good uh, piano player, and one of his fortes was um, ragtime, jazz, honky-tonk. Well, the Hartford Times, when they bought the building, they would hire him to go up and play piano for the parties. So he played on that. This is, the, uh, this is during the High Blaine era. Uh, this is the observation level. They called it the ballroom. Um, I mean, you, you can't see, but you know, all this, this is all wood. Uh, still can't pick out what the floor is, you know, but it uh, might have been wood, might have been linoleum. We, you know, but we, we've since solved that. Had a fireplace in it. The stairs, these are the original stairs, it was just tucked off in that northeast corner compared to the whole east side today. Big bearskin rug. One of the other fun things they had down in the basement was a wine cellar. Um, you might think that this is a little person playing golf, but it's not. It's a gnome. Gilbert was known for having gnomes, these little gnomes all over the place. We have remnants of those. And one of the, one of the things that we've, you know, when you, when you look back into all these pictures, you always find something. And, and here's the flagpole. And uh, a couple years ago, we were out. Uh, walking around at the end of the year and seeing how things were and um, my co-president said oh I want to show you the boiler and we go walking off into the woods and find this big huge uh, I don't have it next it's somewhere um, big huge boiler what she thought was a boiler well it was it was actually another cistern for water and I'm standing on this pipe and she goes oh there's some of the piping for the heating system as well well the pipe was about this big around. I said, ah, that's a little too big for the heating system. And then I noticed, I, I, you know, about 10 feet away, there was a joint, and it wasn't a, a threaded joint, but it was just kind of slipped together. And you go another 15 feet, and there's another joint, and it gets progressively smaller. I found the original flagpole. So one of the things we're looking to do is restore it. Um, we, had, we had priced it out about five years ago, and we're just about ready to pull the trigger and decided not to for two reasons. One, the economy uh, was starting to hurt us with donations. And uh, the state actually gave us a little bit of a hard time because we know that we've got to light it. If we're going to keep a flag that is 12 foot by 18 foot, 75 feet up in the air, it has to be lit. I mean, that's part of our law, part of our regulations. Uh, the state said, no, no, you can't do that. No um, upward light, light pollution. So we kind of got at a standstill. We're working on them, because it'd be fun to, to recreate that. I mean, and we do have all the original components. Again, this is the little picnic area down at the, the west side. They also had, a, Gilbert was a great cook. Um, and this is a rotisserie uh, that we hope to fire up in June. And I'll tell you, June 22nd, we're looking, we're tentatively doing this, uh, a summer solstice party. We're going to do a big pig roast and uh, barbecue up there. Uh, so check out our website, we'll, we'll be announcing that. So one of the things we're going to do is restore the, uh, the rotisserie, um, hopefully get that going. Way south on the property overlooking Ho Pond is one of the little, another little gazebos. Uh, unfortunately the, the storm, the winter two years ago, pretty much collapsed most of the roof on this. Uh, we've got to get in and document it before it's, it's totally gone. Uh, I'm sorry? That was an original structure. Yeah, yeah. And it was all cedar, so that's, you know, it's 100 years old, and it was, it was fun. You know, when I went there maybe five or six years ago, you could still see all these little compartments where obviously they might have had, you know, booze or glasses or plates or something, you know, that, uh, so you didn't have to walk back to the tower. Uh, this is from the tower looking, uh, looking south down towards Ho Pond. This is really kind of hard to see. Here's, here's um, uh, the Wadsworth Estate. Uh, this is very different today in that uh, the, the vegetation has grown up tremendously. We do have some other shots of this area that um, very few trees. Uh, sheep used to be abundant up there, you know, and it was, it was this just big grazing area. There's the cistern. How many acres comprise this from Gilbert? 
uh, I think it was 240. Yeah, and I, I, I think that's about what it is today, you know. Here we are in the living room, or dining room today. This is 1921 edition. It's always nice to be flattered. People use the, the tower all the time. Here's someone who created a huge gingerbread for uh, Habitat for Humanity. Harford Times, this is uh, 19, early 50s to the mid 60s. Um, oh God, I can't remember his first name. Tripp, he was the owner of Harford Times. Uh, I don't believe that's Harry Truman next to him, <laughs> although it looks like him. <laughs> when I saw the shot, I'm like, no way. Uh, the gentleman in the center, Francis Murphy, his wife, Ava, uh, he was the editor. And uh, if you know Bradley Airport a little bit, there's the original terminal was the Francis Murphy Terminal. It was named after him. And I believe this is the party celebrating it. They went to the terminal and, uh, and then High Blind had, or, uh, they had the party up at the Times Tower. Uh, Harper Times used it as uh, an entertainment venue. There was always music, parties, clam bakes. Right there. <laughs> How was that for a segue? So he came up. He was president of Columbia University at that point. There he is again in the center, down near the, uh, the garage. And it was in the chair that's in the living room. We do have that. That's a pretty current photo that he was asked to become president. You recognize another president. He wasn't president of the United States. He was president of the Screen Actors Guild at this point. And he always made sure to get pictures with the staff, which I kind of thought was nice. And uh, just to back up a little bit, this is the Eisenhower Pavilion. This is not original to High Blinds. This is the Eisenhower Pavilion that was uh, um, done for, specifically for the party when they asked Eisenhower to become uh, president. And we're going to hopefully, again, that summer solstice party, we're going to uh, get that up and active again. Maybe not the stove. The stove's in pretty tough shape. Now here we have the uh, uh, observation level um, during the Times era. Uh, very different furniture, very period furniture, 1950s, 1960s. Uh, you can see that everything is painted. Back to the dining room, Times era. Uh, the dining room is probably the, the most original, most correct room that we have. And we do have almost all the original furniture. We've been, um, most of it was taken during the last ownership. Uh, we've been able to get it back. Unfortunately, we've had to buy it back. Again, here's, this is the, uh, the entry. Here's into the living room. Originally, the, in, 1920, uh, in 1914, this was half this size. Uh, it went pretty much down the middle. In 1921, again, high blinds were up there uh, uh, entertaining more and more, and they just basically doubled it, pushed the fireplace further out. Uh, 19, uh, late 50s, I guess it was, I can't remember the exact date, got into private ownership. Uh, and what they wanted to do was apply for a zone change to make the tower a restaurant and offices. And that will. Uh, a lot of people were pretty, um, pretty upset about that. Um, you know, the, everybody's always looked up there, and no one was the public wasn't able to use it, but they still enjoyed it. They didn't, you know, there was even talk about taking the tower down. Uh, they really didn't want to see homes and condos along that ridge line. Um, so they uh, developed a grassroots organization, and they saved, saved the Talk Up Mountain. Uh, talked to DEEP, or now it was DEEP. DEP uh, at that point, um, and they were able to purchase all the land and convert it into a park. So they went about a restoration in the 60s. Uh, again, it, it had seen heavily uh, uh, neglect, a lot of broken windows, uh, no more lights, no more copper, that was all gone. Uh, this is after the restoration. Uh, notice that there aren't these two little flanking windows in here. So they've changed the exterior part of the building a little bit. Uh, ended up putting a whole new clay tile roof on. Um, 
the recreation of that, that we, we funded uh, with $100,000. Uh, it's a state park, and the gentleman in the middle is, is our state uh, park manager, Vin Messino. Uh, he's the one who really allows us to work together and that what we can't do, he does. What he can't do, we do. Uh, we have a great deal of respect. We, we know it's his building. He knows that we do the restoration. Um, for example, this is the sunroom. Uh, this is a 1921 edition. It was originally, or it was originally um, doors out onto these small balconies. At some point, they had been changed to double hung windows. A lovely chrome green floor. Uh, the floor's original canvas. Uh, and then we ended up going and scraping all of the, the trim and the walls and the floor and sending the samples away and getting them analyzed. And these are all back to the original colors. That's kind of some of the fun stuff we, we, uh, we do. Um, this was originally a nice lavender color in Gilbert's bedroom. Uh, we spent about $10,000 to get these windows all redone. Uh, there was a heavy, this is out toward the north, there was heavy water infiltration here, corrected that, uh, and then you know, have since painted it. We have work crews that come up, you know, there's days of carrying, uh, this happens to be CLMP, they come up and uh, we feed them lunch and uh, buy them materials and they couldn't have more fun. Here they are giving the, the observation level another coat of urethane painting the outside gates. I mean, they, they love coming up there. Um, so what's next? Uh, this family wants to move in. <laughs> That's me on the left, believe it or not. Uh, this is a little site plan of, of the park. Here's the tower. Uh, we do have thoughts of another building up there. Um, maybe it looks like this. Maybe it's got... Uh, a museum, maybe it has a, a gift store on the, the first floor, on the main floor, maybe it has a, a small restaurant, maybe it's got a, a place for a, a wedding, maybe 100, 125 people, maybe um, all accessible, which the tower is not. Uh, maybe up here there's a couple classrooms and maybe there's this whole deck that uh, anybody can get up to. Uh, there has since been a little change on this plan in that um, the property to the south has become available. Um, and that gives us the right of way or, or gets us back to a state road so we can get the public up there. Um, that's always been an issue for us is, is trying to get people there. Uh, if you can't hike, I can't get you there. Um, I mean, it's nice that people can get out and get exercise, but we, get, we constantly get people saying, you know, my grandmother used to work for the High Blinds. She's 95. Can we get her up there one last time? I got to say no. Yes, so Jason. Would that property allow the access road? Yeah. Out yeah. Access yeah. We're just, um, we're short about 19 million. <laughs> for, so. But what it would do is, you know, what it would do is it would, it would make that state park, it would give us the, the pond, uh, you know, so I mean, you could use that, um, you know, to generate revenue. We would use their houses, maybe a small venue, generate revenue. Maybe this building would come down towards the pond. Um, so we're, it's, it's been for sale and the state's looking at it. I'm trying to get them to get off their fannies, but uh, well, I don't need to go any further. Um, one of the things we were able to do this past fall is, is we, in doing all the work that we do, we want people to enjoy it. We're, we don't do it just to do it. Uh, this is the garage. You can see how the roof line has changed. Uh, but we ended up having um, uh, 90 people up there for dinner. We ended up restoring. Re, uh, we had the, the what's the, what's the name of the show? The, the, the Extreme Home Makeover, Extreme Garage Makeover. Uh, we ended up doing that on the inside, which I'll show you. Um, I mean, it was, it was purely a garage. We ended up painting it new lights and everything. We ended up putting picnic tables in there and, and we really had a German theme. We ended up having German food. Uh, music, musicians off to the left. Now there they are. And they love doing this and we love having them there. Yeah, they really are. Uh, she was not singing. 
Uh, but we had you know, a bunch of people from around the state. Uh, Tom Tyler is the director for DEP. Um, we, again, German theme, uh, you know, beer, German beer, German wine. Uh, there's the inside. So we had our, uh, our annual meeting up there. Um, thank you for, uh, for letting me talk to you about this. Uh, thanks to the library uh, for having me here. Um, we are open, please come and visit us. We're open Memorial Day, um, Thursdays through Sundays, uh, and then Labor Day through November 1st, seven days a week. We are uh, available, uh, friendsofpipelinetower.org. Um, any questions? Please. Uh, there, there are still some people in Canton. Um, actually, if you if you drive up Route 44 uh, on the Avon side, you will see kind of this English-looking home that is on Montevideo. Look above it, because if you go on Montevideo and loop back towards the civic or to the civic center, towards the science, Gilbert's sons, Dr. Highblind. His, uh, Gilbert's son and grandson ended up becoming radiologists at Hartford Hospital. I could go on about that too, uh, to the point where um, uh, one of the I was talking with one of the family members and she said, oh, I remember my dad coming home and, and he's got blisters, you know, from radiation. You know, it was the first days of radiation. Highline was, uh, the Highline family was very uh, uh, generous to the Hartford Hospital. They ended up building a nursing wing uh, and funded that for a long, long time. So. The family nope, nope, not at all. I mean, we invite them to everything, uh, you know, every correspondence we do, and they're no interest. They're working on this building, though. They're thrilled. I mean, they support us a little bit financially, um, but a lot of a lot of the ones that are there, there's there's actually one woman, uh, Louise McCag, who is in her in her early to mid 80s, and she was the last one that lived there as a high blind. So we still stay in court, obviously in touch with her, you know, and tell her all that we're doing. And actually it's been fun because uh, the, the doors in the, in the sunroom, um, we weren't sure that the, uh, if they were, if it was an open porch or if it was double hung windows. Uh, I did some research and I saw the original drawings that showed it as an open porch, but then some of the photographs showed it as a door onto the little balcony. Well, my co-president gets up, hey, Louise, after Louise, after Gilbert's wife, um, the, sun, the, the sunroom, what was, what was the doors window? <coughs> oh, doors. My uncle used to get after me all the time. Get in off the porch. Get, you're going to fall. You're going to break your neck. So I mean, we've got some of that verification, which we, which we try to use through the family. So any other questions? Yes. You know, we we don't know. We're we're obviously very sensitive to the people that that live the, there. The high blinds probably don't come because they can't hike up. <laughs> true, <laughs> yeah, true. Well, um, she you got her up there. You know, we we can ask permission. Yeah. To there to get them up there. There is a road. Yeah. I mean, if you've been up there, it's uh, it's it's not meant for two-way traffic. Right. And actually, if you get up towards if you get up on Montevideo, that's barely two-way traffic. Mm -hmm. If you take it, take it from the, the Green Gate, which is the driveway to the tower, which is a mile long, it's really just a, a little bit wider driveway than, you know, some of it's not passable. You know, I mean, we can't even get a school bus up there. You know, we have to take, the, you know, when we do shuttle people, it's small vans, so. Well, I was and I, go ahead. It's the original, it's a, it's a print of the original architect's um, rendering. So it dates back into the early teens. Uh, we do have the original and the prints are for sale up at the, um, up at the gift store. And it's fun because, you know, again, we, we use anything we can to, you know, look at, at the window orientations, configurations, and, uh, and certainly pictures are, are the best to, uh, to confirm a lot of that. 
uh, yeah, thank you very much for coming. Thanks to the library uh, for sponsoring this. Uh, keep on their website so that you see other things that, that come up. Uh, this will be filmed, I guess, for uh, SCTV as well. Funding for Simsbury Community Television is provided in part by contributions from viewers like you. Thank you.